Hello, everyone, and welcome, welcome back to another expert episode. Um, this is Liz Soria, your host at the Tax Advisor and Business Coach Success Podcast. Now, remember that uh, we always like to have like and shares and comments, so subscribe. It really makes us grow our audience. And today's a really special guest because I know this has been a hot, hot topic and a lot of people looking into doing alternative investments. And I have Lear Gantz, and he is specializes in cryptocurrency. Uh, hot, hot topic, right? So, uh, Lear, thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, Lear has a very extensive experience, actually. Um, he has been... Uh, you know, uh, very successful in his business and uh, since the age of 16. And uh, he's living the wealthier, more balanced life that a lot of people would like to live. So hopefully we might be able to squeeze a little bit out of him today during this interview and get the best out of him. So thank you, Larry. And it's, it's, it's a great to have you here on our shows. How are you? Um, I'm very, and, um, very well. You've been, you started very, in a very early age. I mean, uh, I think when we're in our teens, we're kind of thinking, uh, what are we going to do our next step in our lives, right? And we kind of, you know, have a lot of ideas because I think between the age of 16 to even possibly even 18, 21, we're in that phase of life where we're wondering, you know, what we're going to do with our future, Right. And, um, and we feel invisible, right? And we're such a force, uh, you know, a uh, person. Why did you start it so early? It just kind of surprises me that you had that kind of, um, I guess, uh, motivation to, to, to start at such an early age. So why, why did you start so early? Tell me, please share. Well, uh, Liz, when I was 13, um, my father's business um, went under. So he, he was bankrupt. And um, it was wow. at, a, at a point where I needed to start, um, you know, spending more money. Obviously, 13 girls and going out and, and wanting to buy stuff and all, all, all things like that. <clears throat> and obviously, I didn't have anything else uh, to fall back on uh, because uh, usually parents supply their teens with, with money. So what I did basically, I was a seventh grader when I got, when I got, my first job, I was a, like an assistant coach in basketball, and I, I, I helped uh, a grown-up person um, coach these uh, first graders, and the mom started to ask me if I can do babysitting, so I started doing babysitting as well, and then um, it, the, my capacity grew uh, to a point where I couldn't do anymore, so I started brokering her, my, uh, brokering currents my friends, and, you know, cutting a, a little coupon off of <laughs> for babysitting in the neighborhood and then painting decks and once I was 16 I um, I had my scooter license started doing deliveries and by the time I was like um, 17 I, I accumulated like 20 grand um, and this is 1997 so 20 grand is like I don't know uh, 50 60 grand today and sure it sure is absolutely so in such an early age you already have accumulated nice little wealth because twenty thousand dollars like you say yes that was that was worth versus now maybe a good forty fifty thousand dollars so yeah. and, and so what happened was Liz um, that is more than, than a teen and a teenager can spend so if you get an allowance as a teenager usually you say okay well, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna buy this uh, gadget or this clothes piece of clothing whatever gonna blow it on on booze whatever it is but 20 grand is is not something you can um spend that easily and so yeah. uh, my mind started thinking okay so what do you do with money i mean you can't just sit there it's it's that, that's retarded so um my grandfather gave me a book from warren buffett uh when i was about 16 and i started reading it and i i got my parents to sign a waiver so i can uh, invest as a as a minor uh, through my bank and in, in, in stocks and investments. And that's how basically that got started. And in Israel, when I was, where I was growing up, everyone has to go to the military. So when I was 18 until 21, I was a full-time combat soldier. And so wow. investments became really passive for me. And then I realized that, hey, this is, this is something that can follow you for the rest of your life. You, you invest your money. And when you're, whatever you're doing, right, you're a soldier now. But still, you can uh, grow your investments. And then I figured that um, if in 
investments are, are passively to make seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven percent a year. To multiply, multiply, huh? Yeah, but if, but if, if, if it's done right, because if not, you can lose it all too, right? That's a, that's a cruel reality. Um, yeah, most investors, um, the problem with most investors basically is that um, since the stock market is so easily accessible to anyone, it takes two hours and um, you got a brokerage account and now you can, the world is at your fingertips. I mean, you can buy thousands and thousands of companies uh, from all around the world. Yeah. Um, but people don't understand that, that it's a profession. In other words, um, people say, okay, I have accumulated such and such. I want to grow that. What can I do? Let's, let's buy stocks, right? And, but they don't treat it as a profession. So with any other profession, you'd, you'd at least go through a few months worth of uh, learning curve or something, right? Sure. Um, but with, with uh, stocks, it seems like people are, you know, they, uh, they put the money into the brokerage account and then they ask the broker, okay, what should I buy? Is sure, it- sure. No, you're absolutely, you know, and, and I don't mean to interrupt, but you're absolutely right. I mean, now in these days, it's so easy to open, you know, a, an account online. Like you said, it's just, you know, so accessible to anyone. You don't need to have a license. You don't have to have a, you know, a, a, a special um, degree or any background. I mean, people could just go and say, I have some funds available and I'm just going to go and gamble because I think that's absolutely. really what they're doing. Yeah, there's no barrier of entry. And um, the difference between investing and gambling, or I would say there's three levels. There's investing, there's speculating, and there's then, then there's gambling. Investing requires um, skill, because what you need, skill and, and, and a bit of touch. I agree. Uh, because uh, basically with investing, what you're doing is you're looking at um, a, a stock as a percentage of a business, of a whole business. And what you want to try and do is find businesses that are priced for some reason below the intrinsic value of the business. Uh, If I can equate this to a property, it would be to ask how much uh, does the land and the construction cost? Good point. If you can buy it below the the construction uh, price, then there's really a good um, probability that you bought it at a very good price because you, you paid no premium um, on this property. Now, obviously, this doesn't happen very often. So um, people even say, why does it even happen? Why would somebody sell their house below the intrinsic value of the house? Why would somebody sell his shares below the intrinsic value of shares? In right. a logical driven world, um, it would not happen, which... Um, propagated this theory back in the 50s uh, was called the efficient market theory, which means that everybody knows everything and therefore there are no um, inefficiencies in the market. And therefore there is no way that any one investor can beat the average or the index or, or a basket of companies. And that um, uh, stigma um, persisted for years until uh, value investing proved just through results that if you are able to figure out this, you can consistently make returns that are better than the average. And so investing requires um, the an analytical ability to find these companies and then a little bit of uh, a touch in order to make sure that you understand that in the future, these companies can keep growing. Because if something is cheap today, very cheap, let's say a house in um, in Detroit, for example, is mm-hmm. priced below construction right now. Um, it's a great uh, investment unless, you know, Detroit becomes a ghost town and then you lose right. all your money. So that touch is is a sensible idea of what, what the future would be because you can buy a company that produces uh, CDs right now, very cheap, but, you know, it doesn't take a lot to understand that it's an obsolete business and you're probably buying it too, uh, you know, too, uh, too expensive no matter how much you're paying for it because uh, you know, CDs are going to be gone if they're not gone already, right? And so it's the same with companies. Some companies are very cheap, but there's a reason for it. But if the reason is not fundamental to what's going on with the business, then mm-hmm. this is a bargain and it's an opportunity. So that is investing. The, the second level is called speculating. And when you speculate... Um, 
you are best basically creating a scenario where you believe in a given future. And because you believe in that given future, you're willing to buy a company that doesn't currently produce any um, earnings. So these would be startup companies or companies that are building a project, but it's, it's not yet uh, you know, making a revenue. So you're right. investing in them uh, money, but you're speculating on whether or not they'll be successful. That's right. Now, um, you, these are obviously higher risk, and therefore, because it's high risk, you have to wait until you can get at a really low price with them. Um, and so uh, this is obviously calls for a lot of patience because uh, the, the higher the risk, it seems like the, the, the more um, well, speculators are willing to pay. In other words, if they hear about a company that has a, a, a drug that is awaiting FDA approval, <laughs> and if uh, it, it gets approved, then it can cure you know, cancer or whatever. I, uh, it seems like they're willing to pay more for this yes. in the future. And what they need to do is find companies that everyone else has given up on and it's going to be easier to catch them at a very distressed price. So even if they are able to, to make a little bit of um, progress, they can um, advance the price. In other words, the lower the price, the better. And uh, investors seem to have it the other way around. They like to chase companies that have done well in the recent past and say, okay, I'm going to buy that company. It's doing very well. Well, if it's doing very well, then you're also paying a lot. And uh, that is where investors get it wrong. It seems so, so logical, right? You go to a store, you're looking for the cheapest TV uh, in, that you can find uh, after you chose the model that you want. So if you, cho if you, you choose a, a given model, then you research online, where can I find this model, which I like, because mm -hmm. it's a quality model for the best price. But in the stock market, people are looking for the best model and they think that, that if the price is, is higher, then somebody knows something I don't, and therefore I'll buy it because if it's going up, then obviously I'm missing out there. Speculations. I, I agree with you. Absolutely. And, and I think that's, that's true. I noticed that, um, I mean, uh, myself, I am, you know, I do invest in stock market. I think the, we try to diversify in different investments, such as real estate, right, which is tangible, and then you have stocks and everything. And, and, and you know, it's interesting everything. By the way, you have a very humble background, and I really admire that. Um, the fact that, you know, uh, you kind of had to... Um, uh, well, it, it happened... But sure. It happened three times. So by the oh. time I was 23, he went bankrupt three times. Is that right? <laughs> it is right. It's, it's, it's <laughs> me on and not him. Or, or maybe it would be more valuable to have my father on just to uh, learn from mistakes. Yeah, I think, well, we try all to learn from mistakes. The problem is when you keep doing the same mistake, and for some reason, some people just don't learn. So that's, that becomes a problem. But, um, you know, I, I, I do, you know, like I said, admire the fact that you come from that humble background because you had to take responsibility and assume all of this to help out with, you know, with the family and to move forward. And, and having the ability at such a young age of saying, okay, I have this money sitting here and I make this nice chunk of money that you say that maybe it would take people, you know, so long to save, but yet you were capable with a little bit help of uh, your grandfather. Is that correct? Well, my grandfather gave me uh, the book. That's two, right. One from Warren Buffett and one from... Imagine, he just give you a, a, like a path, a, a bright star, you know, and show you the path of like, here it is, but it was up to you. That's the thing. It was up to you to make that decision of saying, hmm, I'm going to do this. So it's really a marvel. I know you, you have started many businesses and you've been very successful. And the current business that you have, which we didn't mention at the beginning, was Wealth Research Group. You're one of the editors and one of the founders. Is that correct? Fantastic. And one of the things I wanted to part of this, uh, you know, uh, interview was because I know, like I said, it's a hot trend going on out there and people, again, they're concerned. Some are doing very well and others have no idea whether it might be too late to get into cryptocurrency. So talk a little bit about that with your expertise, please. And, and, and people who are just starting, um, how and what are the best options out there because there's a lot of different uh, ins and outs that you need to learn prior to even stepping in 
And again, I, I look at it as anything that you invest is like gambling. You have to have the money because if you lose it, at least you know you won't need that money to pay you know, for your monthly recurring expenses or for food. But definitely, what would you suggest someone who's listening or watching you know, our interview of saying, okay, I'm thinking, but God, you know what? I'm insecure. I don't know where and how to exactly do this. Is this still a good time to get into buying cryptocurrency? Um, okay, so wealthresearchgroup.com is, is a free financial newsletter, and I, and I launched it two and a half years ago as a, as a labor of love, basically, as a way for me to share investment research that I do personally. I'm a full-time investor, an entrepreneur, a business person, and through Wealth Research Group, I share uh, financial research that I do. And part of what we do is also cover specific opportunities. So we don't just talk about the economy and, and what's going on, but we also actually profile specific ideas. And in 2016, we, um, we were focused a lot about uh, mining shares because in 2016, the Federal Reserve started raising rates for the first time in eight years, uh, interest rates, and That's right. caused um, uh, a lot of investors to cover short positions that they had in the mining sector, and, and mining stocks were doing very well. And then in the, the beginning of 2017, um, Wealth Research started covering cryptocurrencies. We covered Bitcoin at $400, and then went on to the top at around $20,000, um, you know, it's, it's the top as, as it pertains to today because it's trading around, uh, around $8,500 per coin. Um, we covered Ethereum, the first newsletter in the world, to my knowledge, to cover Ethereum at $12. And obviously, uh, Ethereum went up to over $1,200. So a lot of subscribers made. Unbelievable. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Um, I, I interviewed Amanda Johnson, who was uh, the spokesperson for Dash. Um, when it was $30 a coin, Dash went over $1,000 as well. Wow. And then we interviewed Charlie Lee, the, uh, the founder of Litecoin, when every Litecoin was selling for about $20, it went to about 400, uh, 340 per coin. Monero at $19, um, we covered it in early March of 2017. It went over uh, 300 as well. And Steam, which is like this um, coin that is connected to a social media uh, platform at 19 cents and it went over $2. So it was an insane year. And even in, at the end of the year, we covered Ripple, which is uh, trying to change the SWIFT system for banks and make it more, um, more efficient. We covered it at 27 cents and a month later, it was $3. Unbelievable. So, yes. And obviously the trend is, is your friend. So um, when these speculations are, are hot, then people want to, to join. There are more buyers than sellers. And when there are more buyers and sellers in speculative markets, then you see a rally. And when there are more sellers than buyers, then the rally ends. And that's what we saw in January. So the things that are problematic with speculations mm -hmm. is that you never know when they end sure. and for what reason. And therefore, the, the one cure for this is to make sure that your position sizes are very, very modest. In other words, unless you're you want to treat this as a lottery ticket and say, okay, if this works, then I'm going to be changing my life here. But if it doesn't, then uh, I'm, I'm sending myself back 10 years. Unless that's your, your game plan going into this, it's better to put 500 to to $1,000 per coin. And even if it goes up 20 times, $1,000 times 20 is, is a pretty remarkable gain for, for one year with, with so much risk involved. That's right. So, um, and by the way, if, if you want to um, download uh, full reports about cryptocurrencies that we have, you can go to, um, to our uh, website and on the top menu, you click on special reports and it's, it's an aggregated page of about 20 years worth of research on many topics um, that you can pick and choose from. It's like a huge hive of, of um, uh, choices. And if you want specific, specifically about cryptocurrencies, you can go to wealthresearchgroup.com forward slash rocket like like a rocket that, that shoots to the sky or uh, forward slash top five top in the number five and down and down on specific reports about um, some of the alternative currencies or or short altcoins 
um, that we feel are, that have a, a huge potential in 2018. One of, the, one of them has already doubled when uh, Liz in, in, uh, That's great. Uh, in the first three months, yeah. Um, so, but in general, let's talk about cryptocurrencies. So, um, it's a still good time. I mean, I think this is yeah. for people a little bit of concern whether or not, because it had, even though, like you said, took a dip at the beginning of the year, I mean, still, those people who bought so low less than, what, two, three years ago, I mean, look how much it is now. Um, even with the drop, it's still high. Uh, yeah. what, what were you, you know, someone, again, with your background that you've seen, you know, the, 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 the incline of, you know, of this we cannot even call it currency because indeed it's not even yeah, tangible. Not. I mean, there's not something you can exchange with paper coins. Um, but, you know, and, and I, by the way, I'm from Believer of Gold. I love the shine of the gold and silver. I still think that's, that, that's you know, cash and, and metal is still going to be the king in many ways when everything else is gone. But, I mean, crypto is something that I think a lot of people are saying, maybe I'm too late for this. Uh, maybe if I jump now in, I'm going to pay the high, high price. And if it drops, then I'm going to have a huge loss. What is your perspective from that? Um, I, I mean, in regards to someone coming in um, and, and trying to figure out, like you said, because you're advised whether you can invest a little bit in each coin, right? And then hopefully you can split that kind of um, and diversify the risk. So... Liz, let's, let's, let's simplify this, right? What is a cryptocurrency? Uh, a cryptocurrency or a token or a token, token. or to, uh, yeah, a token, a coin, whatever you want to call it, is basically, um, a, a, it's basically um, a, a, a computer code that is generated by someone like me or you or any other person with the, with the technical capabilities to create one. So the technical barrier is non-existent. In other words, if you pay someone who's a developer of coins or tokens, then you can develop coins 24 hours, a Liz coin, a Lear coin, a Jimmy coin, whatever. So the coin itself is worthless um, in terms of its value. There is no value in a coin, in, in a token. Um, it, it's, it's useless. Now, you can ascribe a value to it. You can say, hey, my coin is like gold. You can say that, claim that, it doesn't make it true. So in other words, when people say that it's like digital gold, it's because, okay, so, so they say it. Uh, it's, it's, the value is all subjective. Then you look at further um, at the use case. What can I use this for? It's technology. It's a tool like electricity. Right. Light my house, but it can set me on fire if I do the wrong way. It's a tool. What can I do with this tool, with this cryptocurrency? So the first thing is a, a cryptocurrency is, is a way to exchange, um, a medium of exchange, which is outside of a banking system or a government system. So that's one thing that's important to understand about cryptocurrencies. And that's why they have this aspect of social revolution. That's how they got started. Right. Um, the, the first coin, Bitcoin, was started because of the frustration with the world financial system back in 2008. And somebody said, okay, let's just do peer to peer. What, what do I need a, 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 a broker for? I mean, I have the technology today to just, hey, Liz, you need, you know, I wanna pay you. I'm gonna pay you. Sure. So it, started, it started that way. And when it got started, it got started as a pet project. So every coin was worth one cent at the first <laughs> Imagine that. Imagine that on the on on one side, but on the flip side, you can say, look, um, the the reason that it's that it caught the eye of so many people is because the, the originators they didn't ascribe the correct value to it, so they themselves created a coin that was undervalued, um, right. and, and so it, it it made an amazing run from one cent to twenty thousand dollars per coin. But if you think about it, if you and I were to create a coin today, we would not price it at one cent because we would say, look, our coin can do one, two, three, four, five, six. I think it's going to be worth much more than one cent. Why price it at one cent? Those people had no idea what it would be worth, what, you know, what the network effect of it will be, and therefore they mispriced it initially. And, and so 
it created an opportunity for all the early people that, that knew about it to accumulate some of them. Remember how they accumulated them. They used their computer in order to mine them. And mining uh, coins through your personal computer is not um, practical anymore. It's, it got commercialized. You're, nowadays, you need a huge um, facility with plenty of, uh, of skills, like uh, business skills, in order to create a profitable uh, mining um, facility. And so, uh, so that's the technical side. So creating a, a cryptocurrency is not the problem. You're, what you want to find, as, as with any other business list, you want to find mm -hmm. something that, that helps other people solve problems. I agree. Um, okay. So uh, it, it's like a phone, right? Uh, you know, countless thousands of companies can, can create phones. It's not a problem to create a phone. What is unique about your phone? What could it help solve? And therefore, um, you got to look at any cryptocurrency as um, with this value proposition. What can it solve? What's, what sort of a problem does the world have that this project aims to solve? Now, if you own a few of the coins or a few of the tokens, then you own a piece of this project. And as this project becomes more valuable, your coins will become more valuable. Um, and Increases in value, right, as with time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and therefore it is pure speculation. This is not an investment because you don't, it, it, it doesn't return any money to you. When you hold a Bitcoin and let's say the government says you, no one can, can uh, trade Bitcoin in, anymore. Everyone that has their Bitcoins, congratulations, you own Bitcoins. If you can't trade them, then they have- What's the use? What's the use of it? There's no purpose. Exactly. If you own a farm, for example, and somebody says for the next five years, no one can sell or buy farms, you will still do well because you can plant crops and, and sell the crops. Or Correct. Or it generates, it produces. So Bitcoin or any other of the cryptocurrencies do not produce anything. And because they do not produce anything, you uh, place all of your future value to it as a speculation as to what, what will happen in the future for this coin. Yeah. Uh, Bitcoin could have been uh, the worst uh, accepted idea ever, and it would be a waste of time and energy and, and everything like that for, for uh, every, everyone that was involved in it. To tell you the truth was when the internet got started, uh, dig digital cash got started in the 90s and it didn't get accepted for 20 years later and so um, look at me believe it or not i i, I kind of got the very first time that I, I well i come from a very extensive background too uh, I, I have like three careers but besides that i mean when i started i was in the computer uh programming at background and happened what I actually, with one of my classmates, we built my first PC from scratch, from pieces, and, and, and you know, put everything all together. And, um, I, and I share this with you because now in 1997, I never forget this, I actually sat in front of my, one of the computers and for the first time, I actually connected with the internet. And I thought it blew my mind. I thought, oh my goodness, what is this? I mean, you know, and I'm talking way back in the times where, you know, I uh, used to connect with the um, dial-up, you know, connections, and it was like you were out of space, <laughs> and used to get disconnected like every hour or half an hour, depending how lucky you were. I mean, so I, I have come from a very extensive background. You're right. In 1997 is when I first connected to a browser into the internet and I thought I was blown away. And again, a lot of people didn't get into it till the, the 2000s, you know? So I think that's a big difference, but it's very interesting that, you know, your explanation because there's always history to everything that has happened to where, where, where it is now. And I love when people are able to capable of sharing the background of something, how it started. And, and again, I think when it comes to investment, like you said, you know, there could be a possibility to a good, you know, a good chance to, to invest, but don't put all your eggs in, in one nest, like they always tell you. Sure. And, and remember, cryptography has been around forever. And the blockchain, which is the database that this is all based on, has been around since the 70s. So this is Incredible. Yeah. This is basically a marriage between uh, a few ideas that have been around for a long time, but, but have now caught... Um, the eye of the public and why have they caught the eye of the public so i was alluding to this firstly 
One is the idea that it's outside of the government system, and therefore the fear that, that central banks or government will create currencies that are unstable and, and will create runaway inflation, like we've seen in Zimbabwe and Argentina, like people are fearful with the US dollar, for example, for, for many instances in the past 10 years. This is something that uh, prompts people to um, move some of their money into um, these networks that you can uh, exchange value, exchange funds without the use of uh, fiat currencies. So that's one thing that's important about them. Um, and, 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 and I'm sorry to interrupt there for a moment. I think also people are tired of the monopoly. Let, let, let's yeah, be straightforward. I mean, you know, and like you said at the beginning of, of the interview, the, the fact is that, you know, we have been regulated so much by all these financials and banks uh, telling us that anytime we move money, we have to pay them a share. Why? You know, so I think it's getting to that point where people are waking up and saying, you know what, I, I don't, I don't want to, you know, waste my money. And I feel like every time I have to transfer, I always have to pay a percentage, a fee. Why? And I think that's how also cryptocurrency has become so powerful because it's kind of regulating, you know, the regulations that have happened for such a long time. And I, I and from my perspective, I would tell you, I know banks, institutions, they hate cryptocurrency. I mean, because they're, they're in a threat. That's how they feel right now. Well, but you, but you have to remember, Liz, that um, the miners make money by mining new coins, uh, and, and it's the reward they get for, for keeping the blockchain um, incorruptible. But remember, once all the, the coins of a given uh, coin system have been mined, the miners will keep doing their job in exchange for fees. So it's not like you're going to uh, transfer uh, bitcoins for zero or, or any of the other currencies for zero unless there's... There's a cost to doing this no matter what, um, but the banks have never had competition. And now there's competition, and competition drives the price of these down and makes sure. Uh, and that's a much better way, to, better way the way you define it, true. That is true. Exactly. Okay, now they have the competition and never existed before. So now, you know, they have to compete <laughs> for now. Now remember, uh, a fiat currency, uh, or what you have at your Bank of America uh, checking account, is not your own money. That's right. These digits are representative of uh, money that you keep in their system. You can withdraw it, but essentially, if everyone in the world was trying to withdraw their own uh, at the same time, it would be impossible because it's, it's a fractional system. And sure. there's this fear of a, a systematic fear. Um, the third thing is that a fiat currency is basically credit and not... Um, and not money. So uh, there's cryptocurrency, there's fiat currencies, and there, then there's uh, alternative currencies like gold or silver, etc. Sure. So um, a fiat system is made built based on credit, and that is also a risk. So one risk is the risk of systemic risk of a fractional reserve system. The other, the other thing is the risk of mismanaging the fiat system by governments or central banks. And the third thing is the fact that uh, their, the fees are better, you can move money around the world uh, instantly, etc. And the fourth uh, use case is that it's cheap. The fifth use case is that it's private. And mm -hmm. the sixth use case is that it actually is yours. So if you want to give a present to a friend, you can give him a, a cold storage um, wallet with <laughs> cryptocurrency on it, and no one, you know, nobody would be the wiser. So it's, it's a great way to exchange um, anything because right now it's it's uh, it's cryptocurrency but in, in the future it will be something else <clears throat> and so this is a very new world and because this is a new world uh, Liz there's a, a big cloud hanging above it called regulations and so that is part of the problem it's, it's still not regulated My it's still not lawful in many countries the tax situation with it is unknown because uh, the agencies have not classified it either as commodities, utilities. That's right. Securities. So there's a huge cloud uh, hanging over it. And therefore, um, there is a necessity to make sure that, that, that you don't take everything that you've got and believe in, a, in one future, a future where cryptocurrencies rule the world and blah, 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 because it might not happen. And then there's 
there's another thing you can do. You can split your investment portfolio into cryptocurrencies and actually uh, blockchain related opportunities because a lot of companies are using the blockchain for non-financial use cases uh, in order to secure supply chains. So let's say you go to your local Walmart and you want to see where the, the tomatoes in your Heinz bottle came from. You, you will be able to scan the, the bottle and the blockchain will show you or in your phone you will see very easily, very user-friendly where these tomatoes come from because all of the people on the supply chain will be able to to say, okay, the tomatoes are actually come from a field here in, in, in Mexico. They then pass hands, blah, 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 et cetera. And so uh, the blockchain is, is a data, um, it's a database system that will be used in many key areas in insurance and in, uh, well, any, anywhere that there's, there's a need to log information. So this can be anything that has to do with your medical uh, information because 70,000 people will die a year in the U.S. alone. Because is that right? Of, like that? You know, the nurse is not writing the right uh, allergies for the for the doctor to show, and then the doctor doesn't know what the, the patient is allergic for, and they give him the the wrong uh, drug. People die. Seventy thousand people. That's insane. Um, and so your medical records will be incorruptible, and um, obviously, you know, voting and, and political systems that are more corrupt uh, will be visible and, and, and incorruptible evidence by the by the police and all the other agencies will have to be on a blockchain. So the blockchain is, is something that um, has endless opportunities and companies like IBM, Oracle, Microsoft, Intel, everyone's getting involved, in each of them with their own angle to it. And there are also startup companies that are getting involved. The, the, um, um, the opportunity there is that these companies are going to be created as regular companies trading on the stock market, not ICOs trading on exchanges, which are still unregulated. And so um, you can look at this as pure speculation with a regulatory cloud and a revolutionary socialistic um, societal uh, angle. And then you can go with cryptocurrencies or you can look at the blockchain sector and say this has much more than just a crypto just a currency use or just a financial right. use, many other uses, how can I invest in those types of um, ideas as well? And those have no regulatory problems at, at all. No, no, no government is saying anything um, about the, the, the blockchain technology itself because, as I said, it's been around since the 70s. So um, at the end of the day, with understanding that this is pure speculation, you're asking yourself, okay, what can I do with blockchain that is actually an investment and therefore you can find companies that actually make a profit from building a blockchain how do you do that and well think of a think of a, a road if you were able to to build as they do in europe many private roads and put a toll booth on it then you build the road one time and then you collect uh tolls from all the passengers that, that pass on it for decades and, and perhaps if the if it will be around in centuries, then in centuries from now, if we use cars, right? The blockchain is the same way. So companies are going to develop their blockchains, a database system, for other companies to to use. Same as um, you know, Google created a search engine which other people come and use. So people, right. companies will build blockchain systems that other people will use. And they will charge them a fee. They will make money off of that, and then you will have. Uh, a chance in the next few years to be to get involved with the first Amazons, and Microsoft, and Intels of the blockchain era, and and so there's many growth opportunities that are going to be um, just unbelievable. I remind you that Cisco System, the company that in the 90s, you know this, um, developed the router, which basically allows all the computers in the world to talk. Sure. Had, had um, uh, risen in the 90s to create over 10,000 millionaires. It is the company that created more investor millionaires than any other company in the world. And Isn't that incredible? Yeah, it's, it's yeah. incredible. And, and remember that uh, right now, cryptocurrencies do not talk with each other. So that idea is also in the works here. So a company will, will be able to build that. So how do you 
um, make a profit from this. First of all, you need to have connections because you need to understand which companies are um, getting uh, getting started. So you can be an early investor. Uh, so that's one thing that's important. And you can't just do that by talking to your friends at the cooler about cryptocurrencies. You have to- No, no, those are not the people that you want to talk to, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> you want to go to the conferences. You want to go to meetups. You want to uh, talk with entrepreneurs. That's how I got. That's how I found out about Ethereum at twelve dollars. I was at, at, at a conference. And Incredible. People talk about smart contracts for the first time, and that's how we we, um, we learned about this. And so, uh, becoming a uh, an investor that's an activist investor or that looks for opportunities by going places. Is, and networking is essential if you want to be early to the table because what is uh, how do you make money with all these you have to be early earlier than the next guy because he's gonna pay more right um, but what happens to people who are not early birds <laughs> well, if you're not an early bird then this is this is not an opportunity for you in other words people that are people that are smart do the same thing that people that are stupid do, but they do it first. So, sure. so if, if you're late, then don't do anything. Be patient. Uh, there, there's no easy solution here. You were late. There's a consequence to being late, and you have to deal with that consequence. And so the consequence is do nothing. Uh, it, it, because whatever you do now is too late. It's, it's a simple reality. Good point. Good point. I like your point. You know, Larry, thank you so much. I mean, you've been phenomenal. I mean, I, I, I hope that someday we can do like a second part or a third part because you have so much, you know, of vital information in your mind. And, and I can tell that, again, you have a very humble background and, and you love sharing your, your, your knowledge. And I think that this is part of what we do when we use these kind of, you know, uh, you know, uh, videos and, and, and recordings because it really helps the people out there to, to realize. Be, but again, you, you just brought up a very good point that I do agree with you. Surround yourself by people who are influencers, people who are already doing what you want them to do because those are the people that really know. And I always tell people you cannot expect to, you know, succeed in certain things in life, whether it's your career, your investment, you need people to support you around you. So what better than, you know, like you said, get together with people who have that kind of expertise and can help you, you know, move forward. So can I say something about this? Because this is important. Because I, I, I listen to countless um, coaches and gurus. Yes. And many people say, surround yourself. You're the average of your, of your best five friends. All these mantras. And it's true. But. And but. There's a big but. It's not like you can um, surround yourself with great people by 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 going and, and standing next to them and just rubbing against the shoulder the next lucky or successful person. I think you have to take action too. It's like anything else. Um, you can wish and wish and surround yourself by all these wonderful people, but there's a point that you need to move forward. You need to make certain things to make things happen. Sure. What's, then, what's your perspective on that? <laughs> it's it's. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you need to take action, but but I, I want to go even deeper in that and tell you that the only way that you can surround yourself with these types of people is becoming that type of person. In other words, if, if, if you are not investing at least two to three hours a day in yourself, then there is no way you can really pr- progress in life. Um, listening to podcasts is one thing, but thinking about what you heard in the podcast is is really what's important. If you don't think uh, and, and become a really um, a, a deep level thinker, a second level and third level thinker, someone who asks and then what, and then what, and then what, and, and has um, a rich internal world, there's really no way that other people that, that do have this rich internal world and, and value their time in life will want to associate with you. And so it, it, it's not a matter of begging other people or, or um, you know, pressuring other people to, to get into your sphere. It's about becoming someone who has something to contribute and therefore you'll, you'll be able to, to move um, instantly into these areas. I can, and I can tell you this, <clears throat> um, reading books is one thing, you know, 
really educating yourself is one thing, but absolutely, if you want doors to open for you, you have to become simply a, a more uh, magnetic personality, which is something that you don't learn in books. It's something that you have to practice. So, in other words, that is so true. Thanks for sharing that with us, really, Nero, yeah, because definitely. it's true. It has to do with your personality too. And you can, I always believe. I've seen a lot of people, and you probably have two with PhDs, and all my due respect to all of them, you know, because I know what it is to study past exams, and you know, and we don't, we've been through all that. But the fact is that I think there's something in your personality and that it's going to make you, it's going to help you. It's like an ingredient that's going to help you to succeed. Because I would say success is not one single ingredient. There are multiple ingredients that combine together to make you the person you are. Sure. Just understand that, that uh, personality is what gets you less objections in life. And if you can uh, um, find one thing to, to, to improve in 2017, make it flexibility. Um, if you can become more flexible and um, disregard uh, any pettiness, anything that, that is not really important, don't make a big deal out of it and become very flexible and the fl I can give you no better example than a chameleon. Chameleon is still a chameleon no matter what color it is. So uh, somebody who's flexible is not somebody who bends over backwards and changes his principles every day like Hillary Clinton. It, it's someone who sticks to what he knows is true, but he changes his colors um, like a dog adapts to his owner. Um, and, and if you can do that, then you have something that is rare and that can really open doors for you. If you can become flexible in 2018, I guarantee you that you'll make much more money in 2019 because opportunities that are blocked to you currently because you don't know the right people um, and, and right. through many other ingredients that are called coincidences, but they're really not, um, you'll be able to, to um, advance in anything that you do in your career and your place of business you can attract more customers it just uh, all starts from uh, becoming flexible to other people's needs and opinions and uh, being more tolerant if you can do that uh, I guarantee you that will make you more money uh, instantly like in, in a year or two than reading all the books and going to all the PhDs um, doing whatever academia you, you, you want to do um, because that is what helps you become a conversational person and that opens the doors truly obviously couple that with real talent and, and with real skill in, in, in something that you do like an expertise and that's an it's a irresistible combo so i, I well, hope i uh, help uh, with that. It's, it's been amazing. You know, I, I can honestly tell you that I really appreciate all your advice and it really has helped a lot my audience because I think, like I said, again, um, you know, we all have different ways of investing in just knowing how to be careful, cautious, all we need to be, you know, and I think the last few words were really came from your heart and I really appreciate that. Um, so it's, it's, no matter what circumstances where we act right now in this moment, we can always change it. We always in control of changing things that we want for our future. So I think it's within ourselves and how much we really want to push forward to better our future. Um, and I tell that to a lot of people out there because a lot of the, the audience that hear us, they're solo entrepreneurs or they, they really have successful business, but sometimes they're looking for different ways. And, uh, and, and I hope this brought a lot of value to them. Lira, thank you so much once again. It's been a great, it's been actually not great, amazing to have you uh, as, as a, you know, an expert uh, guest here in my, in my um, you know, podcast. And like I said, I hope to have you again because I can tell, I, I can get a lot, a lot of you. So we need you around here next time. So hopefully we can do another part. But once again, thank you a lot. And how, once again, how can the audience reach you, your website again and information, please? So... I am a full-time investor and uh, wealthresearchgroup.com is basically my outlet to share with people um, uh, investment information, uh, g general information, and um, anything that has to do with our sole mission, which is to strengthen your financial fortress. Um, and, and, and basically, if you go to wealthresearchgroup.com, the website, and uh, you can either subscribe to the newsletter, which is 
just the best way to stay updated. Or you can use the website itself um, to download uh, reports that are in a myriad of subjects, and each one of them can can really add a nugget to to your puzzle. Great, thank you, thank you. And once again, folks, it, it's been great to have, like I said, the special guest. I mean, I, I, you, you provide a lot of information more than what I originally expected. So um, once again, I'm grateful for that. And uh, to all my uh, audience and my folks out there, thank you for watching and listening and always remembering to like, share, and subscribe. It really helps a lot. And to the next episode, I will see you soon. Goodbye, everyone.